So welcome everybody. We are here for another episode of Ask Justin Anything or Ask a Real Estate Agent Anything. If you don't know me, we do this every Monday from 1 until 1.30. We get a lot of questions on Instagram and all of our different platforms, from clients, from friends. So we centralize it into one place to make it very clear and concise for you. We are going to be digging into a whole bunch of stuff when it comes to purchasing real estate, what it's like to deal with things in a seller's market, what a seller's market is. And I think this episode will offer a lot of value to how people are navigating the marketplace today. As always, we do this live on multiple platforms. It's Facebook, it's YouTube, it's my LinkedIn channel using a platform called StreamYard on the back end. So if you guys are in those platforms, feel free to comment. Let me know you're here because I don't actually know unless you jump in the comments, say what's up. Today's an extra special day. I wouldn't normally say this, but I'm going to get a bunch of you that are pinging me on the back end about this and I don't want my phone to blow up. Today is my birthday and I actually wanted to still do this and be consistent because it's one of my favorite days. I love digging into these topics. One of my favorite things about this business is I'm constantly searching for information. Right. And we're the people that are in between. Nicola Saravolo on LinkedIn says, so valuable. Thank you, my friend. Nicola is one of my oldest buddies from Montreal. Always makes me smile, always makes me laugh. And, you know, we're information seekers in this industry. So as I'm getting these questions, I'm doing research. The team is talking about it. We're refining our craft and sharpening our sword and getting better at what we do by the fact that we're having to go out and get that information. So definitely appreciate that. Because we're using StreamYard, I'm actually going to get rid of that overlay. There was a little overlay there saying we were live. We're still getting used to this platform. Um, this lives in perpetuity on our YouTube channel. So if you ever want to go back into back episodes, you're interested in more content, go to the YouTube channel. That's where we're going to have a whole pile of guests coming on. People that are much smarter than myself that I'm bringing in to discuss various topics. And that's where we're posting it evergreen. So it is always there for you. So let's dig right into it. I want this to be super practical and super tactical. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate that. So the questions that we have for today's episode, the very first question I had was they're having a really tough time selling a property. Should I lower the list price or offer an incentive to sell my home faster? Now, what they're talking about is they're listed on the multiple listing service. And this question was specific to, should I increase the commission to incentivize the buyer agents to get their buyers to write contracts on my property? Now it can be done. And it is something that people talk about in the back channels of real estate, but is it ethical? right? My issue with this strategy is if agents are telling their buyers or pushing them to offer on properties based on the commissions that they're making, they're breaking the number one rule in real estate. And that is the fiduciary duty that you have to a client is to put their interests above your own. But you're telling them to write an offer on a property because you're getting paid a little bit more. Quite frankly, I don't even really look at the CB on deals when I'm showing properties. The CB is the cooperating brokerage fee. But I am going to backtrack for a second because when you're putting out your property and you're pricing it, you're marketing it, and you're negotiating it, what you're offering as a CB does unfortunately impact some of the attention that it gets. That's just the nature of it. You offer somebody a 25% cooperative brokerage fee, you're probably going to stand out in the crowd. And if you're looking at commission fees, which are actually illegal to state as being an average of, if you're offering more then say the competition in your marketplace, yeah, your inventory might stand out or all of a sudden it might make it into the showing pile where it didn't before. So incentivizing somebody to sell your home by offering a higher commission fee may get you a little bit more attention, but I promise you dropping the list price is going to give you more, right? Because that's something that unequivocally is going to be understood by all. And if you're having a hard time selling your property, understand that there's three things that directly impact the sale of your property in this order. And that is the price of the property because even the worst property on the face of the earth priced right is going to sell. Now, if the price is bright, bang on for what it should be. The second is going to be the condition of the home. How does the home show? Am I showing up to this correctly priced home and it's in shambles and it smells terrible and you know, it just doesn't equate to a good experience. Well, if you can fix the condition and it's priced correctly, quite likely it'll sell. But if it's priced correctly and it's being marketed correctly or it's being, shown correctly in good condition. The last thing is marketing, right? Are you getting in front of the right buyers? And that's something we spend a lot of time focusing on in terms of creating custom audiences, making sure we're targeting the right people, making sure that we're everywhere from a print, digital, organic perspective, picking up the phone and calling people, seeing who's active in the marketplace. Here's a fun strategy for you or your agent. If you're having a hard time selling a property, pull a list of any agent that sold a property in that area in the last year and then call them. 
and ask them what's going on. Do they have anybody for this type of property? Get some feedback for them. That's a very simple tactic. It doesn't actually cost you any money. It just takes a little bit of time. But a lot of times people are scared to do the work. So I would say if you're going to look at list price versus an incentive to sell your home faster, you know, I would go with the list price. Um, if you're not getting the activity in this marketplace, especially it's clearly something wrong, likely with the price or the way that the property is being presented. So I take a look at those three items and break it down. Hopefully that gives you some value. I'm going to try and keep these questions very concise. I'm going to try and do five questions about five minutes each to get you out of here. Hopefully even before one if you're here live, feel free to jump into the chat, drop something in the comment and I'll answer it live at the end of the first five that we go through. The next question, a little bit more detailed. What is the first step in the home buying process? A lot of times people think it's just go online and start searching realtor.ca or all these other sites that they have out there. It's actually not the right step. The first thing you want to do is you want to pull together your power team. And let me be very clear. This isn't an advertisement for real estate agents. Yes, I own a brokerage. No, I don't care if you use me or not. Do I think that I'd provide a better level of service and I could do the best job out there? Of course, otherwise I wouldn't be in this industry. But regardless of that, the power team is what I would do if I wasn't in the business at all. And that would be who has access to information I don't. If I'm going into a marketplace, I don't understand. Even as an agent, if I'm going to Vancouver, I'm probably calling Kelly and Cameron and people out there. If I'm going to Hamilton, I'm calling my boy, Mike Heddle. I'm calling experts in their marketplace. They know the zoning challenges. They know the development issues. They know what the good neighborhoods are because they've put their 10,000 hours in. Then once I have that person, the next person I'm going to find is my mortgage agent because, okay, I've identified where I'm going to go purchase, but how am I going to buy it? right? The money is a big problem for a lot of people in terms of understanding what options are out there. So having a very dialed in mortgage agent or somebody to walk you through that financial process is critical. Now, a lot of times if I'm working in a specific market, I'm working with preferred vendors of the say real estate agent that I'm working with in that market, mainly because they're the quarterback, they're connected, they deal with hundreds of transactions, if not thousands over their careers. And a lot of times they have ability of seeing a little bit further down the pipeline. You know, who are the people that are doing deals, offering good ethical advice, aren't just trying to get a fee or, you know, kick somebody to another lender because they're making a little bit more money there. Who is really looking out for the clients? The ones that stand the test of time will put others' interests above theirs. And that comes down to fiduciary duty. What I talked about, you should be looking for in an agent or a representative, you should be looking for in a mortgage broker as well. But like I said, go to the quarterback, have a discussion with them, ask for two or three referrals, and then I bounce back between those to find a good fit for your personality. The next thing you're going to want to do is pick an attorney. Um, biggest mistake people make in real estate is waiting till the very last second. They write an offer on a deal send paperwork to a lawyer at the last second, and then everything's happening very, very quickly at the end. My opinion, get introduced to an attorney up front, establish a rapport and a relationship with them, find out what they're going to need from you so that you're organized and you're ready to rock. Now that you've had that power team, then you have the ability to deploy them at any point in time. Think about it. It's almost like a zero cost solution until you do a transaction. These people are going to go out and be able to work for you, answer a lot of questions that you're dealing with through the real estate transaction and be an extra set of arms, eyes, ears, legs, feet, whatever you want um, as you're going down your real estate journey. And again, if you pick the right ones, they're going to be able to tell you about a lot of speed bumps. Now, the next part is the fun part. Again, we're talking very general topic um, today in terms of real estate. So it could be commercial real estate, could be investment, could be new construction, residential. You're going to pick a property type and a home type. So let's pretend you're buying a residential resale. You're Nicola because he's on the stream and you want to go back to the community you grew up in and buy a house, maybe the one that you used to live in, whatever. It popped up for sale, right? And you're like, you know what? I want a two-story house because I have a thousand kids and I want a backyard with a pool because that's awesome. It's super fun. You're narrowing down what your search is looking for. If you're like, well, I'm pre-approved for $700,000. Show me what I can buy. You're actually making the power team's job a little bit more difficult from being able to provide value because the more concise you are, the more they can turn around and find what you're looking for, or at least put you in front of the opportunities as they pop up. The most dialed in buyers get the most dialed in opportunities. You're looking for these houses in these neighborhoods. Yeah, it might take you a little bit longer, but as I get off market deals, you're first in my mind for that type of property. So I'd say get dialed in, but I'm also going to let you in on a little secret in the real estate industry. A lot of people don't know 
Guess what agents say behind closed doors? They say buyers are liars. Not because you're an actual liar, but because buyers don't necessarily always know what they're looking for. And that's okay too. Buyers will walk into a situation, say, I'm pre-approved for this much. I want to live in Old South because of X, Y, and Z. And these are the neighborhoods that you know all my friends live in. This is where I want to live. Yet the lifestyle that they're going to be living is actually completely counterintuitive to living in that style of home. So this is again where your power team will come in. We've had buyers come in and saying, I want new home construction. I want to be in these neighborhoods. And as we're taking them through, we're extrapolating what life is going to be like. Yeah, you're the first home on the street. Great equity play. They're doing three more phased in price jumps in these neighborhoods. You're going to make probably another 30% on your home on top of the market appreciation, which nobody can promise. That's another discussion. Um, but those are the upsides of buying in new neighborhoods. Are you okay that you're going to be living in a dust cloud for five to 10 years, right? As they're building out these next three phases, because the lot you're selecting is right in line where those phase extensions are going to go. And you're going to have a lot of heavy equipment and, and your kids aren't necessarily going to be able to run out and play in the streets, right? There's ways of approaching different asset classes. And if they want a new home, finding a neighborhood that's a little bit more developed that you can get into, but this is the dichotomy of finding real estate and understanding that you need to be flexible depending on what you think your needs are as to what your actual needs are. And the right power team can definitely help you with that. Now you found the property. The next phase is negotiate the deal. And this is where things can go well, or they can go really poorly very quickly. Um, a lot of times people will get excited about the negotiation process. They've watched too many movies. They just want to come in and lowball for the sake of lowballing when the deal that is right in front of them is a phenomenal deal. They lowball the property. They maybe you know dissuade the sellers a little bit, goes into sign back. All of a sudden, next day, two more offers come in. They're in multiples and it sells for a price that they still would have paid anyways, right? So negotiating a property or having a proper negotiation strategy from the outset to me is as important as dealing with the power team. So sitting down with our buyers and the people we're strategizing with and saying, here's our option. Because as I said, nobody has a crystal ball. Here's path one, path two, path three. Here's the risk of those paths. Which one would you like to go down? When we agree on it, I'm going to go 100% down that path. Nobody's going to know we have this conversation but us. But that's where taking a step back will put you in a better position to negotiate a transaction in the best light possible. Best negotiation tip I could possibly give you, always be prepared to walk away. If you get an offer on your property and your agent says to you, listen, if we sign this back, there's a complete possibility that these people ghost and they're gone. Are you okay with that? Because this is a firm deal and a price that could move you on to the next phase in your life. And you say, nope, sign it back 40K higher than that. And they leave. Don't turn around and get upset at your agent because you signed it back 40 grand higher and those people walk if your agent gave you that ability to have that conversation with them. So planning your negotiation strategy, super important. Sign the actual contract. Depending on what type of market you're in, it's a madhouse in a lot of markets right now. Not a lot of people are necessarily putting conditions in your contract, which I always recommend, but that's a separate discussion. You know, you're going to have a due diligence period. So if you've accepted an offer and it has home inspection, financing, insurance, you're going to have, you know, typically call it seven to 14 days, depending on what type of market you're in. If you're in the commercial world, maybe it's 30, 45, 60 days. And that is your time to go through and make sure that what you agreed to on paper is what you're actually getting right? High risk investors will go in. They won't even see properties and write offers on them sight unseen because they built that risk factor into their pro forma. A lot of times when you're purchasing a residential home, you're going to have a home inspector go through it. You're going to run your file through your mortgage broker. You're going to have your lawyer look at your documents. These are all the steps that it takes to actually go through and make sure that you know, you're qualifying the asset that you're getting. One note that I will make on that is that is a critical junction in which you know once everything checks out, a lot of people can get stuck in paralysis by analysis. You know, buyer and seller's remorse is a real thing. It happens to every single buyer on the planet. It happens to every single seller on the planet. Meaning, buy a property, you close. A month later, you're like, I think I overpaid. Meanwhile, the seller on the other end of that transaction turns around. He's like, I think I sold it for less than I could have got. You're both right. I mean, ultimately, you may be paid a little bit more than the market would have bared at the time, which is why you got it right? If you didn't overpay, you wouldn't get the property. So congratulations, you, you got a property. On the sales side, yeah, if you waited one day more, real estate appreciates in value, you'd probably would have got more money. But was the opportunity cost of those sales? I think to a case in point, when we had a personal transaction, we could have waited another six months and made more on the sale of our home. But then the construction costs of materials actually went up. So 
long story short, you can't look at hindsight. That's a latent indicator. You want to look at the active indicators and what you're going to be doing moving forward to succeed. If you are on the stream, I have no idea because I'm using StreamYard, which is a pretty cool streaming platform. Drop a like or something in the comments. Let me know you're here. Eric Scarfoni, my production assistant is here. He's a monster. We're going to be doing more and more of these to bring you value. If you have any questions, drop them in here and I will do a rapid fire at the end for you as well. It can be around all things, real estate sales, marketing, business building, whatever you want. And I'd be happy to be there for you. Now, question three, how long does it take to buy a home? How long it takes to buy a home completely depends on the first two questions that I answered. How prepared are you both from the financing side, both from understanding what you're going to buy and then line that up with the inventory. If no inventory exists, it may take you a while, but guess what? If you're prepared, it may take you a day. It may take you two years. It all depends on the opportunities that come across your desk and the opportunities that you go and find. This is a funny business. The deals that you think are going to be the easiest sometimes end up being the most complex and difficult. The ones that you think are going to be very difficult oftentimes end up being the easiest and you never know. And that's coming from somebody that's done a lot of business and a lot of transactions. The whole right home comes along with the right home comes along. I'll, I'll equate it to a story that I had with two really good friends of mine, Jeremy and Joy. I mean, Jer's what, 6'9", if you're watching this stream, he's looking for a house with a finished basement in Old South. Very difficult find. Showed them 49 houses. I work with the best clients on the planet. They were apologetic. I'm so sorry. You know, none of these houses worked. I didn't care. If you're working with the right person, understand this. Those 49 houses, I now have in-depth knowledge of. I've gone through them. I've looked at them. How do they compare? I gave pricing opinions on those houses. So if you're in Old South, you need to sell a house in London, Ontario, call me because I've probably been in a house on one of your streets, right? So if you're working with the right person, they're going to be there for you. They're not going to push you into something that's not the right fit. But the vice versa is true. I've also shown people houses where they walk into it, ticks every single box. It's the right house for them for whatever reason. If they don't purchase it, they may end up having to wait a while because another house that compares to that one doesn't come along for some time. And it's a very fine line to walk as an agent if you're watching this to understand that you got to assume that they know what's right for them and be there to support them in the right decision. But as a consumer, you need to understand that not every agent is just trying to sell you something to get a paycheck. Sometimes when they say it's the right house, it's the right house. And what can happen in a real estate transaction is it can get a little sticky when you have a lot of people giving you opinions on a transaction where you start second guessing yourself. As my good friend Scott McGilvery says, everybody gets 99 reasons to do something. They get stuck on the one reason not to. And then they look back 10 years later and don't understand why? So I'm just going to give you that little vote of confidence and hopefully that helps you today. Number four, how is the London, Ontario real estate market? This is a thing. So waves up and down is what I would say, right? Every single week we are seeing fluctuations in inventory. It is a seller's market, which we'll get into in a second. That's actually the fifth question. So you're going to want to stick around for that. But currently we're seeing a myriad of things happening. So we are seeing very high priced inventory selling in multiples, a couple hundred thousand dollars over asking price and lower priced inventory all of a sudden not getting offers on offer date. And then you're seeing other lower priced inventory getting 14 offers and selling close to 200,000 over asking price. That just happened to us last week. It's property specific. And if you ask an agent, how's the market? And they tell you, great, go find another agent. Because how the market is really depends on what asset class. Are you a buyer? Are you a seller? Are you an investor? Are you in commercial? Are you buying residential? Are you buying in Grand Bend, Ontario, where the cottage COVID craze is a real thing and happening, but the weather's been really bad and maybe people didn't show up last week because they didn't want to make the drive? It depends, right? So what I would say is day to day, we are making adaptations depending on the inventory that we're sitting on or what we're looking at with buyers. And we're advising based on the needs of our sellers and buyers. Sometimes the, the right move is to wait for the inventory to come or wait for a better opportunity because it's completely financial. Sometimes it's, this is a phenomenal opportunity for you and the opportunity cost of you not buying this could potentially mean the market's going to increase again, another 10% in the next six months. That's a real thing and can happen. So if you're going to be sitting on this and the, all the optics and numbers work, buy it now before that happens, right? It's what I said goes back to at the beginning in terms of having a power team that is dialed into what is currently happening in the marketplace. Fun fact, real estate agents 
that just put listings on the MLS don't really matter anymore. Honestly, like if all your value prop is to turn around and say, Hey, I'm going to put you on the MLS. I'm going to give you sold data. There's all kinds of websites that actually offer that the expertise of a real estate agent looking narrow focused at how they can bring their clients value is the future of real estate. Talking to a builder and saying, what pain points can I put out for you? Looking at land that they've assembled their projects are rolling out and saying, you know what? Yeah, I could sell 30 of those. Let's pull back and let's just sell X amount of them so that your material costs are protected and we don't just blow it out because we can't, right? Like what's the market going to be like in eight months? Cause that's when you're closing and building these properties, right? It's, you know, with the buyers, giving them that advice of saying, this is what's happening today. This is what we see coming down the line and then being dialed into the things they can't find on MLS. So if anything of value to any real estate agents watching or buyers or sellers or anybody else is find the people that can give you information that you can't find on your own on MLS. I think that's where it's at. The market's on fire, but there's still really good opportunities. Um, a lot of investors are wondering, oh, you know, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Meanwhile, I'm seeing deals on the MLS and we're writing deals with investors that are knockout cash flow, have great upside. You just got to know how to look at it. Number five, and we will wrap up after this question. Udelka, thank you for joining us. Um, Udelka, if you have a question, I can't see you. I just need you to drop it in the actual comments and I will answer it for sure. And number five, so what is a seller's market? We just talked about the London, Ontario market and a lot of other markets right now are seller's markets. Essentially, it's when there's more buyers than sellers, right? And there's no inventory. And the sellers are listing for aggressive prices getting way over asking price. And there's this fervor in the marketplace. We've seen these fluctuations since about 2017. I still remember when it started happening early on. I called my friends in Toronto. I said, how do you guys even navigate this, right? Conditions with no offers. You know, I saw one on the weekend. Place had been for sale for two years. They relisted it at an aggressive price and it ended up going 150,000 over asking price. Like makes no sense. But that's what can happen in a seller's market is that fervor puts people in an emotional state. The sellers kind of have all the cards and are sitting back and then making decisions based on the fact that, you know, they're reading things in the news. Now, what can go wrong in a seller's market is sellers can read the news too much and think this is happening every single day and say, you know, I'm expecting to get 200 over. They list and they don't get anything over. And then they're still at that same price, right? There are strategies you can implement if you're in that situation, if you're planning for it, you'll be all right. But just from an actual metric standpoint, I'll share some language in the real estate world that might help you. And that is months of inventory. So it's a metric we look at on a regular basis. And months of inventory in the real estate industry essentially means if there were no more houses listed today, based on the amount of sales that are happening, how long would it take before there's no more houses available? And currently, I think we're sitting at about 1.7 months of inventory. Go back about six months in our market, we were less than a month, meaning there were way more sales happening than listings coming to market. But as you can see, that months of inventory increasing, it shows that we're leaning more towards a bit of a, not balanced market, but skewing less on the seller's market type of things and doing deals with buyers. So, you know, if I was going to extrapolate a seller's market, just keep it very, very simple, way more buyers than there are sellers in the marketplace, way less houses than needed. So when a house comes up, there's a lot of people looking for it. Understand what I said about the market the market specific to where the property is located. A house in London, Ontario is not the same as Windsor or Sarnia or Kitchener or in London, Ontario, different than Port Stanley or Elmer or all these different towns and things are changing on a daily basis. So if you get advice from somebody in the real estate space, understand there is a timestamp to that. And if they're good at their job, they'll be able to update you on a daily basis and they should be digging into the statistics because that's what they are paid to do. I appreciate your time. As always, we do this every Monday from 1 to 1.30. Hit me up on Instagram at justin.conico. You can send me DMs, any questions you want answered. It can be anything in terms of the real estate space, sales, marketing, media, anything the team is up to. I'm just happy that I get to do this every week with you and I will see you next week. Take care, everybody.